Well, no matter where you are in life, there is one question we can always ask ourselves that will always lead us to the place where God wants us to be. This is a question that we are going to see Joseph realizing throughout his journey. He covers many chapters here in Genesis. And it's, it's a question that will help us as well in our journey, a realization that he had, and it's a question that we can ask. And the question is this, if you'd like to jot this down, write down this one question. You'll hear it several times today, but jot it down. It's, it's this, what would I do in my situation if I was absolutely convinced that God was with me? What would I do in my situation if I was absolutely convinced that God was with me? The Lord tells us in Matthew 28, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And this question can be a filter through which we get God's perspective on our decisions, on our heartache, on our pain and suffering, physical or otherwise. The life and times of a young man named Joseph will be our backdrop as we look at how this question gave him the right perspective. We meet Joseph at 17 years old and follow him for 13 of the worst years of his life. He goes through unimaginable pain and suffering. And we'll look at that today, as well as some of the results of all that over the next couple of weeks. Next week, we're going to see a man who has so much wealth and power, we can't fathom. And we'll see how that goes. But then the week after next, we'll see a man who has just as much wealth and power and the ability to pay back every person who's ever harmed him, but he doesn't. And in that, we're going to look back and we're going to see this whole story of Joseph being a picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And what a beautiful picture it is. And during each of these three weeks, we're going to see that he is a man. Joseph is a man who always does in his situation what anybody would do in his situation if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. Why? Because it's when I'm convinced that God is with me that I begin to see God in my circumstances and sense his presence and have more patience for my situation. And this is a great study for all of us because each of us has been in a situation that we simply could not fix. And we will learn that our job is not to fix it, but to respond as anybody would if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. So Genesis 37, let's look together. I'll make some comments as we go. We're going to cover several chapters today. And so we'll have a running commentary and, and make some observations as we go. Now, Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. So a reminder for us that these are all uh, brothers of one father, but many of them are half-brothers with four different mothers. So we see something here in Joseph, and that is that he would rather please his father than his brothers. But he's going to get on their bad side by being a tattletale. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. Well, that's not helping the situation. So already the brothers know that he's the favorite. Not a good idea, dad. And then on top of that, he's going to tattle on them. If you have a pen, underline, very colored tunic. Does anybody have long sleeved uh, robe? Uh, that really is a better translation than very colored. It was not necessarily many colors as, as the illustrations in our children's uh, Bibles show us. It's, it's really more of a long sleeve. And the reason that was so offensive to the brothers was because that was a symbol of authority. That was given to someone uh, who was over the others. And so that was, um, again, 
not putting him in very good light with his brothers. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they, underline the word, hated him. They didn't just dislike him. They didn't have a bad attitude. They hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So we see here, as we've seen already in this family, there's a lot of dysfunction. <laughs> this is a troubled family. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they, underline, hated him even more. This is not going well. And he said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they, underline, hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow down ourselves before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept these sayings in mind. Then his brothers went to the pasture of their flock in Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, For not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem, come, and I'll send you to them. And he said, I'll go. And he said to them, Go now, and see about the welfare of your brothers, and the welfare of the flock, and bring back word to me. So he sent him in the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man said, What are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where you're pasturing the flock. And the man said, they've moved on from here, for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. So he would not have been really helped along his way to find his brothers had that person not been there. So already we're going to see God's hand working in his life to bring him to a place of suffering. Let me say that again. God's hand is moving in his life to bring him to a place of suffering. That's what he's doing. God put someone in his path to lead him to his brothers so they would throw him in a pit. God knew what he's doing, but it doesn't make sense to us. If you've never read the story before, this is not going well. It doesn't look like God's really with him at this point. This is fulfilling God's plan for his life. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God's doing something in him and going to do something powerfully through him to save many people. And again, to be a picture for us of Jesus. Verse 18 when they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They had a plan to kill him. That was what they wanted to do. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say <clears throat> that a wild beast has devoured him. Then let us see what will come of his dreams. Again, not the model family, <laughs> but one through whom God uses to bring the, the message of salvation to the world. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So he had a plan to take care of him. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was in him on him, and they took him and threw him in the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. So it probably was not a very soft landing when he got thrown into the pit. They were not gentle with him as they ripped off the long-sleeved robe, the garment. Then what did they do? Verse 25, did you see that? They sat down and had lunch. They sat down and had a meal. Clearly, their hearts are not even sensitive to what's going on in their hearts towards their brother. They're going to plan to leave him for dead. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on the way to bring them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And will not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. So compassionate, right? 
and his brothers listen to him. Let's not kill him. Let's just sell him as a slave. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. So the question at this point, perhaps in your mind, again, if you've never seen it, even if you have seen it up to this point, where is God in all this? Where is God in his life? Where is God fulfilling his purposes? This hasn't been written yet. They're living out their faith in God. There's no written word. He's not read ahead. He's not gone to chapter 39 and 40. He's not gone to 41 and 42. He's not gone to the end of the book to see what happens next and how God will use all this. That's good for us to keep in mind. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments, and he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood, and they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father. We found this. Please examine it. See if it's, notice, your sons, not our brothers, tunic or not. He examined it and said, It's my son's tunic. Wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, Surely I'll go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Things have gone from bad to worse, and now the brothers are showing again even how callous they are by letting their father believe that he is dead. We're going to come to see 38 another week. Let's go over to chapter 39, and we'll see Joseph in Potiphar's house. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt And Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And here's the phrase I want you to underline. You'll see it several times. And the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. What? Wait, 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 wait. The Lord was with Joseph. First, he's stripped of his clothing, thrown into a pit. Then he's sold as a slave. They feign his death to to dad. And the Lord was with Joseph. He's from a wealthy family. He has all he needs. He tells his brothers a couple of dreams, and now he's a slave. What did he do wrong? Where did he go wrong? He didn't. But suffering has been appointed to him in God's design for a reason. If the Lord was with him in our mind, in our thinking, wouldn't he be back home and his brothers would be slaves in Egypt? Wouldn't that be the way we would expect it to go down? If the Lord is with him and he's a good person, then these bad things wouldn't be happening to him, right? That's the way we like to think. Now, his master saw that, underline, the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all, and you're going to see all and everything several times in the next few, few verses. Watch this. The Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. He made him overseer over his house and all that he owned and put him in his put it in his charge. I'm going to pause there and say, when we are living our lives, no matter what we're going through physically, emotionally, financially, in such a way that we're absolutely convinced that God is with us, people notice. They see Jesus. And that's what happened here. He found favor. He's giving this this promotion, if you will, because he sees something's different about him. And people notice in your life, in my life, when we have that perspective that Joseph had. And it came about that from that time, he made him overseer in his house and over how much? All that he owned. The Lord blessed 
the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. Now, I don't know about you, but that what we just read there said that because of Joseph, the Egyptian was blessed. If I'm Joseph, I'm thinking, okay, how about blessing me because of me? <laughs> At this point, isn't being blessed from what we can see. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And that tees up the next verse because it says, it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. She's not very subtle. She, she didn't, doesn't have much couth here. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put me in charge of all that he has. There is no one greater in his house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil, underline this great evil, and sin against God? The Bible calls evil, evil. What is Joseph doing here? Well, he's taking a stand. He's saying no to sin. He's trusting God. What Joseph's doing here is simply responding to this situation, this temptation, as anyone would respond who is absolutely convinced that God is with them. He's responding to sexual temptation because he realizes, he remembers, he knows, my God is with me. And because of the love and grace and blessing of God on my life, I'm not going to do anything to hurt that relationship with my God. That's what's going on. He doesn't have the written word. He has the relationship with God. He knows his responsibility is not to fix this problem with Potiphar's wife. Listen, it's hard to be faithful to God if you feel that God is not being faithful to you. He believes that God is being faithful to him. You may want to write, write this down. When my back is against the wall, I will either make decisions upon my interpretation of my circumstances or upon God's promises. His back was against the wall. If he had said yes to her advances, he would have compromised everything in his life. He said no, and he knew that he ran the risk of execution. He knew that she would come with false claims about his saying no to her. So when my back is against the wall, I will either make decisions upon the interpretation of my circumstances or upon God's promises. In Hebrews 13, it says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say when we are facing financial, emotional, temptation, physical, pain, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Joseph remembered that this act of Potiphar's wife towards him was a great evil. That's what he called it. He said, this is a great evil. Your Bible may have great wickedness. We often want to call sin by another name. Hostility and temper are sometimes called in our culture, in our world, self-expression. Pride is called self-esteem. Gluttony is called the good life. Covetousness is trying to get ahead. 
Perversion is called an alternative lifestyle. Adultery is a cry for help in a bad marriage. The Bible calls evil, evil. And Joseph remembered, as he said to her, it's a sin against God. Again, her proposition was probably, him giving into it was probably very risk-free because there was little chance of getting caught. But Joseph cared more than about getting caught in his sin knowing that everything was before the eyes of God. Joseph had a real enough relationship with God that he cared more about God and his relationship with him than he did about getting caught before human eyes. When I regarded God, one of my sources says it this way, when I regarded God as a tyrant, I thought sin was just a trifle. But when I knew him to be my father, then I mourned that I could ever have kicked against him when I thought that God was hard, I found it easy to sin. When I found God so kind, so good, so overflowing with compassion, I smote upon my breast to think that I could have ever rebelled against the one who loved me so much and sought my good. The King James Version Genesis 39, 12. Let's read on. It says, And it came about as she spoke day after day that he did not listen to her, to lie beside her or be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household were there inside. She caught him by his garment and said, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. King James Version of verse 12 says, He left the garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He got himself out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no one else was going to get him out. God provides a way of escape. No temptation has ever overcome you, but such as common demand, and God will provide a way of escape. But you have to take the way out, as Joseph did. He's the one who said, okay, I'm going to get myself out of here wasn't done for him. God provided the way. We must take the way. Verse 13, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of the household and said to them, see that he has brought, he, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh Potiphar, whoever, has brought in a Hebrew to make sport of us. He came in to me and to lie with me, and I screamed. And it came about when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. And then she spoke to him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came to me and made sport of me. It happened as I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now it came about when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, that his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him in the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. What's strange about verse 20? Why, why was he not executed right away? Every source I looked at said that the same thing, that they believe, based on that reaction, that he didn't believe his wife. Had he believed her, he would have had Joseph executed right away. Now we know God's hand of protection is on Joseph. So God's working even in the hearts of the pagans that are around him to keep him safe and secure. Joseph comes to this place and he says, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God who Maybe we just insert a verse between verses 9 and 10 and say, who, by the way, lately has not done me any favors. But that's the way I would respond. That's the way we would respond. But he doesn't. Joseph doesn't let bitterness take root in his heart. Why? Because he really believes that the situation he's in, no matter what it is, he's convinced absolutely that God is with him. 
So he takes this stand for what is right, and he goes to jail. At this point, you and I may have come to our lowest point. Why pray? Why even bother? We may have given up on God, thrown up our hands. It's clear God is against me. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. And we don't know how Joseph had such knowledge, how he had such a a, a deep relationship with God and deep trust in God, but he did. And I just really wonder if it was because we see it repeated over and over in his life, the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord was with him, the Lord his God was with him. The Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him what? Favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Because of Joseph's faithfulness, because of God's blessing, God made sure Joseph was advanced in his position, even as a slave. It would have been easy for Joseph to do what we so often do, think little of his present position because it seemed so bad. He was a slave after all. But Joseph believed God could bless him right where he was. So he didn't wait for a better situation to be blessed by God. Sometimes we find ourselves waiting for a better situation to be blessed by God. He realized that God's blessing didn't always look like blessing. Because God was with him, he was blessed. He was thankful in all circumstances, as we're called to do as well. So by the way, at the end of verse 21, it says the word chief jailer. The best word for that is the warden. That's the, uh, he's over all the prison, okay? And the chief jailer, the warden, committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. So the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because why? The Lord was with him. When the Bible repeats something, Notice it. He's telling us something. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. The Lord was with Joseph. And again, to which, if it was me, I might say something like, Lord, don't be with me (laughs) right now. I had enough of you being with me. Go be with someone else, Lord. Since you've been with me, I've been ripped from my family. I've been thrown into a pit. I've been sold as a slave. You've blessed others because of me instead of me. I've been accused of rape, and now I'm in jail. I need a break. Please, go bless someone else. Go be with someone else. Here's a good idea. Go be with my brothers just like you've been with me. That would, that would, be, that would be good. That's probably what I would do. Maybe you too. We tend to look at this and say that none of this should be happening. So what does Joseph do while he's in prison? He does something right. There's something about him. There's something different about his countenance, about his peace, something different about his life, so much so that he finds favor the favor of God's on him, but they notice and they promote him. The chief jailer, the warden promotes him. But Joseph, while he's in prison, we find that he does what anybody in his situation would do if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker of the king offended of Egypt offended offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. Apparently, Potiphar had a a bad case of royal indigestion, and he said, get out of here. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them, and they were in confinement for some time. The cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt 
who were confined in jail both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? The literal word there for sad, by the way, is evil or mischief, turmoil. They're in turmoil over this dream that they've had. Then they said to him, we've had a dream and, and there's no one to interpret it. And then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me. And on the vine, there were branches. And as it was budding, its blossoms came out and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said, this is the interpretation of it. Three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift you up your head and restore you to your office and will put Pharaoh's cup into your hand, his hand, according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep in mind when it goes well with you and please do me the kindness by mentioning to me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. Again, he's trusting, he's believing God's with him, but he's still human. He's still saying, hey, maybe God put you here and help me interpret this dream so I can get out of here. Right? When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. In the top basket, there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. And the birds were eating them out of the baskets on my head. Then Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. Three baskets are three days. Oh, this is going good. This is good. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift you up. Yes, lift up your head from you. Lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh off you. And maybe the baker at this point said, you know what? Um, let's try. Got any other interpretations? Because I'm not, I'm not really keen on that one. Can we, can we try again? Um, I, don't think, I don't receive that. <laughs> I don't receive that one. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, underline, but forgot him. He forgot him. He forgot him. That's the thanks he gets for being faithful to God, for being faithful to these fellow prisoners, for interpreting from hearing from God. His reward is more time in prison. It's upside down from what we think and the way we think. There comes a time <clears throat> in every believer's life, or several times in some cases, when we face a difficult situation and we ask, how am I going to get through this? If you want to write this down, all I have to do is simply take the next step that anyone would take if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. What's holding someone back when they go through a trial, financial, emotional, relational, health? What's holding them back from taking the next step? Sometimes it's because we've bought the lie that God's not with us. In fact, we've bought the lie that he's against us. That he's our adversary, not our advocate. To define God by my circumstances or to define God by his faithfulness to me. Every day we have a choice. Am I going to define God by my circumstances or define God by his faithfulness to me? Jesus said in John 14, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. 
believe also in me. But Lord, do you see what's going on in my life? Yes. And therefore he would say in the same chapter, John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. But Lord, I feel so alone. I feel like this isn't adding up, God. And he says further in John 14, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Here's the deal. The world's peace is based on circumstances. God's peace is based on his presence in the middle of our circumstances. Joseph's story begins when he's 17 years old. And for 10 years, his situation does not seem to improve at all. In fact, it gets worse and worse and worse. The only positive thing is that he gets these promotions in jail. <laughs> he gets promoted in a place that he really doesn't want to be. That doesn't look like favor to us. Only in hindsight will he see God's hand in all of the suffering that he endured. We have trouble waiting on God for 10 minutes, much less 10 years. <laughs> Yet the same God was working behind the scenes for Joseph is the same God who's working behind the scenes for us. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, it says, The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you, nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's a familiar verse. But do you know why he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Because sometimes we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. By his gracious hand, he leads us. We live in a fallen world. And this is why we need to be reminded that God is with us. How does this question that we can ask ourselves throughout our lives change someone's life. What would I do in my situation if I was absolutely convinced that God was with me? Two things, jot these down, and this, we'll wrap it up with this. How can this one question change my life? Number one, it will help you accomplish things you would never do before. It will help you accomplish things that you would never do before. Because it has a direct impact on our faith. Number two, it will help you endure some very difficult times in life. It'll help you accomplish and endure. How? Because this question is the filter through which we get God's perspective of our situation. So here's the opportunity we have this week. Let's go for one solid week and ask this one question in the middle of every situation that we face. Big decisions, small decisions, big pain, small pain, crisis, chronic, or just ones that pop up. Ask that question this week. Commit to that and see what God does. What would someone do in my situation if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them? Let's all stand and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we consider these truths from your word and from the life of Joseph. And Lord, we look at his perseverance. We look at what you did and how you 
kept him from getting bitter. We look at his faithfulness to you and your faithfulness to him. And in some respects, Lord, it's, it's a hard lesson to learn. We don't like suffering. We, we'd rather take another path. But although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And Lord, there's no other place that we'd rather be than with you. So Lord, thank you for this body of believers. Thank you for those who are joining here and remotely. Bless each one, Lord. Thank you for their love for the word. Your love for your kingdom. Lord, take these truths, plant them in our hearts. Keep us till we meet again. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.